There had been a robbery in Habitsville. An actual, real-life bank robbery in my hometown. And I couldn't have been happier. I'm sorry, maybe that's a little insensitive? Of course, I'm not, I'm not pro-crime. But as a small-time newspaper reporter whose job is too often limited by library branches and high school sports, this is the most interesting work week I could hope for. Besides, I might be overselling it a bit. They call them bank robbers. I mean, yeah, they took place in a bank. The Bank of Habitsville, to be specific. Yes, all three incidents happened at the same building, only a few days apart. And yes, there was breaking and entering in the dead of night by anonymous criminals. They wiped security camera footage, but this isn't quite Ocean's Eleven. The robbers always broke into Vault 713. And they never took any money. Each break-in happened at midnight, and each triggered the bank's alarm system, both of the building itself and for individual vaults. So it was fairly easy to find where the strangers had been, even without any sort of security tape evidence. After the first one, the money was counted frantically. The biggest heist we'd ever seen in Habitsville was kids swiping candy from the gas station, so no one was prepared for an actual set of prepared criminals to make off with the savings of private citizens. Like I said, none of the money was missing. Police thought it was the most curious thing that someone would go to all that trouble only to leave the vault exactly how they found it. Until after the third break-in and the third recounting. They realized the contents of the vault weren't how they had always been. There, inside the vault, was something new. Now, at first, it was difficult for me to get any information. It's not odd for the police to be a bit hush-hush with members of the press, but something about this felt different. Nobody seemed to know anything. And the low-level officers that I approached weren't standoffish or secretive. They just seemed as clueless as I was, insisting other officers were involved in the case, not them. Then, the strangest thing happened. I was invited to the bank. Now, there's two reasons why the Habitsville police chief would call me, Samuel Singer, to the scene of a mysterious crime. One is to take flattering pictures of cops working hard on the case for the newspaper, so the townspeople felt like something was being done. The second is because they've read some of my other work. My stories about strange murders, horrific sights, and all the peculiarities I've found within the limits of our small town. When I arrived at the bank the next morning, and found it completely deserted, I knew which reason it was. There was an eerie stillness in the air, like the moment rain suddenly stops after a storm. All the evidence of activity was there. Police cars with headlights on, some of the doors open, but the actual people were nowhere to be found. I walked along the perimeter of the building full of unease. Had it been some sort of prank? I mean, was I was I not really supposed to be there? The voice on the phone had seemed legit, very authoritative and police-like. No, something very much unplanned had happened here. My footsteps echoed off the marble floor, scuffed with morning traffic, but still, no one seemed to be in the bank's lobby either. The armchairs and small couches in the waiting area were empty, and no faces looked back at me from behind the teller's plexiglass. Hello? I called out. The only answer I got was my own voice bouncing back to me. I began to walk, peering around corners and eventually moving towards the door next to the teller stations, the one that read, Employees Only, in big black letters. The door must have led to the rest of the bank, and perhaps to the people who invited me here. I turned the handle, and to my surprise, it gave way. Instantly, the small hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I mean, all that was before me was a dimly lit hallway with plain beige carpeting and a few hotel paintings on the walls. Nothing too out of the ordinary, and yet, yet I had the overwhelming feeling that something was desperately wrong within the bank. I just couldn't put my finger on it. I crept cautiously down the stretch. My footsteps muted and careful. Hello? I called out again, my voice breaking the steady silence. I passed a few offices, each empty, though most of them had computer monitors fired up and displaying unopened emails and half-filled spreadsheets. I kept up my slow pace along the doorframe, until the contents of one room caught my attention. It was a well-decorated office, definitely one of the nicer ones. 
with custom painted walls and little sculptures on a bookshelf. And there, on the cherrywood desk, was a candle, reduced entirely to liquid, the wick burning tall and smoking. I hesitantly entered the room, and finding it once again empty, I made my way over to the unattended flame and blew it out. There it was again. The bizarre feeling, the strong strangeness I, I couldn't explain, and then as the smoke curled upward through the air, up to my nostrils, I knew what it was. I, I couldn't smell a thing. Not in the way that happens when I'm sick or when my allergies start acting up. Uh, not a hint of the candle or its smoke was registering with my nose. In fact, the ambient smell of the bank as soon as I stepped into the back hallway was was completely absent. I felt strange because for the first time in my entire existence, I was smelling the absolute lack of scent. I left the room quickly. I, I couldn't help but take deep breaths, trying to pull any semblance of aroma into my lungs, but there was nothing. I walked faster down the hallway now, my heart hammering hard in my chest. Hello? I called out, but again, there was no answer. I passed a few other offices, each uninhabited, until I reached another door, this time labeled Authorized Personnel Only. On any other day, in any other set of circumstances, I would probably hesitate to call myself Authorized Personnel of a bank, but I was, I was getting truly nervous that something inexplicable and terrible was going on, so I only waited a moment before I turned the handle and went inside. Before me was a set of stairs, dark and cold under a single fluorescent light. A small plaque on the wall told me where the descent would lead. The vaults. I had been around the outside of the building, the lobby, even the offices, and I hadn't found a soul. This was the last place I had to search. The journey down was longer than I expected it to be. My footsteps echoed against the stone walls, and the air turned frigid the deeper I traveled down into the dark. As I walked, I tried a few more times to pick up any sort of scent, but it was no use. There was nothing. I considered what I would do if I didn't find anyone down there, about, about how I would go about filing missing persons reports of all the bank workers and, and who I would file it to, seeing as the police on the scene had disappeared as well. I was lost in these thoughts when suddenly my breath hitched in my throat and that all too familiar sensation of wrongness gripped my body. It only took me a moment this time to figure out what had happened. I couldn't hear my footsteps anymore. I stomped my foot down hard upon the stone just to be sure and when no sound reverberated back to me, a chilling feeling of despair sank into my chest. What was happening to me? Two of my senses were gone, and I had no idea why. The silence was eerie. A type of quiet I had never experienced before. No whistling of my own breath. No, no air conditioning in the background. Nothing. I briefly considered going back up. Leaving the depths of the bank and all of its strangeness behind. But when I peered down to the steps below me, I, I could see it. A light, white and fluorescent, shining a line underneath another door. I ran down quickly, still taken aback by the lack of my own footsteps that should have been clattering down the stairs. I got to the door, and there it was again, another sign that read authorized personnel only, but this time I hardly even gave it a second glance before I threw the door open. Now what I found inside was bizarre. To my right and left were vaults, large, impressive, made of smooth steel with security keypads and small plaques with each vault number above them. 708 was on my left, 709 on my right, and there, halfway across the hall, right at the line between 707 and 710, I saw something I couldn't explain. Now, the best way to describe it is that things started losing their... thingness. The, the great vaults and their polished metal halfway down the hall began to lose their shine and, and definition. Vault 707 and 710 still had the security keypads, but, but instead of black numbers backlit by green light, they were just plain rectangles. The vault door, in fact, no longer stood out from the wall, but became 
two-dimensional partway through, as though a mural drawn on the wall. I crept forward with trepidation, past Vault 707 and 710, and reached the end of the ill-defined hall. Then I turned the corner, and my mouth fell open in a silent scream. There were three vaults, 711, 712, which were closed, and 713, which was not. Though I couldn't see inside from where I was standing, I was looking at 711 and 712 in that moment. I'm sure of it, though the sight of them might suggest otherwise. The numbers on their plaques were gone, the plaques themselves reduced to flat rectangles, and the vault doors were merely crudely drawn circles against the wall. The same for Vault 13, the one that was open, and though, though the missing numbers could have thrown me off, I was sure this was the place where the robbery had happened. I knew it because, because that's where the police officers were. Only, they weren't police officers anymore. It was as though slowly, painstakingly, every bit of definition had been pulled from their being. They stood frozen in place at the entrance of the vaults, their hands fleshy circles, their fingers melded together. Some had eyes sunken into their faces like paper dolls. Others had been smothered over by skin. The uniforms had melded with their flesh, all buttons, medals of honor erased. I tried calling to them out of instinct, though I suspected they wouldn't be able to hear me. I had forgotten I couldn't hear myself. I turned back around, tentatively peering into Vault 13, the open vault. The bank robbers hadn't taken anything, and they certainly hadn't left anything behind. They'd stolen everything and left nothing. The view that greeted me within Vault 13 was like... It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. It was... It was like a... A nothing I had ever seen before. The vault was empty. And not to say that the metal shelves were robbed of their paper stacks, or there was no gold bars in the center of the floor. There was... There was no cash, no gold, or shelves, or even a floor. Instead, a great white expanse of space stretched before me, seemingly endless. The corners to the vault were gone, indistinguishable from the blankness. There was no ceiling. It was as though reality itself had simply been washed away, erased. I dared not stick my head in. Something instinctual deep within the pit of my belly told me that this was not the place for me, not a place for anything that wished to remain living. I hesitated, unsure of how to go on. For only a moment I saw it. A flicker of movement in the corner of my eye. In any other ordinary setting, it would have been unnoticeable. <laughs> but in the uncanny stillness of the bank basement, it stood out enormously. It had been to my right, and as I whipped my head around, I saw a figure standing there. It was a woman, but I only deduced this because of the long hair that was pulled back beneath her police officer's cap. I mean, just one, I said, long hair. Because what I assumed had once been long locks of flax and blonde that had fused together into a single cylinder, reduced to that basic shape against the rectangle of her torso in a flat sphere of her head. Only her head wasn't entirely flat. See, there was... There on the smooth expanse of what was once her face was half a mouth. The other half had been reduced to flat skin, and so the whole of it was a, a wound only partially healed. The remaining half mouth was moving as much as it could, each spastic manipulation of the lips tearing at the closed edge. The spittle that flew from her was tinged pink with blood, and I couldn't tell what the half-mouth was saying at first, partially because it was only half a mouth, and partially because I'd only been deaf for the previous few minutes. I hadn't learned how to read lips. Eventually, though, I could tell what she was saying. At first, I thought it was, help me. And my, my heart sank because, of course, I had no idea how to do what she asked. No real way to tell her how hopeless her, our situation was. As I watched her, my pulse rocketed at full speed, and the nausea and anxiety deep in the pit of my stomach, I, I noticed it. Her mouth was closing up like a, 
like a cruel zipper each time her lips came together to repeat her mantra. The skin kept closing just a little bit more, and each time they reopened, they ripped just a bit too. Close, rip, close, rip, close, rip. I could do nothing but watch. And by the end, only a tiny hole of a mouth was left. And though most of it was concealed by the thick, rosy foam of saliva and blood she was admitting, I could see what she was saying. No matter how much I wish I couldn't. Kill me. Kill me. Kill me. Then the mouth was gone. And all was still. Instinctively, I reached for her hand for some semblance of comfort. If not for her, then for me. It was nothing more than a fleshy cube that was once a clenched fist. It wasn't warm or cold. It wasn't anything, really. That was when I dropped her hand. Tentatively, I reached my fingertip up to my mouth and popped it in. Then I bit harder. I brought my finger away from my mouth, and I saw that it was red. My heart sank even further. Not only could I not taste the blood I had drawn, I... I hadn't been able to feel the bite. I stared down at my hands, completely bewildered and shocked by the lack of sensation. Then I noticed something even more terrible. My fingerprints... were gone. My fingers were, were completely smooth, unblemished, as though they had never had any marks on them in the first place. And that's when I decided it was time to leave. I passed by the frozen, faceless police officers as I traced my steps back the way I'd come, away from the three vaults that had been broken into. I walked quickly, but it was difficult, now that the loss of feeling had crept its way into my legs, and as I walked, the worst possibility began to turn to reality. The police officers at the end of the hallway were gone. Well, well not gone exactly, though their featureless figures no longer took up room on the floor. Their likenesses were still present. They were flattened against the walls like a terrible geometric mural of suffering. They blended into one another, tortured subjects all, all melded together in a single painting. Was that the final step to this terrible process? Becoming two-dimensional and then, eventually, join that great white void that had already overtaken Vault 713. I didn't want to stick around to find out. I traveled faster now and saw that more of the vaults had joined the others than I had seen before. Their doors no longer stood out from the walls. The plaques that displayed the numbers no longer showed any writing. Everything was sinking into the backdrop. The hallways became cavernous and empty. And then... A horrifying thought dawned on me. I began to run with great difficulty, my numb legs and feet meeting the floor clumsily as I rounded the final corner. Then I saw what I had feared had already begun to come true. There at the end of the hallway was the door I had entered, the one that read authorized personnel only, except except it didn't say that anymore. In fact, the sign itself was blank and the corners no longer stood out from the metal of the door. I knew what would happen next. I, I lunged for the handle. I, I gripped it as tightly as I could with the numb fingers. I turned and I pulled. Nothing happened. The door didn't budge, and it was clear why. Around the edges, it had fused with the wall. The beginning signs of the same fading and conjoining that everything else beneath the bank had gone through. My hands shook with the effort and the incredible amount of fear that was coursing through my veins. I looked at them pleadingly, as though willing them to find the strength to yank the door from its hinges. That was when I noticed... I didn't have fingernails anymore. They hadn't fallen off or been ripped or anything. They were... There were no wounds. It was as though they had simply sunk into my skin. Like a twin reabsorbed in the womb. I grabbed the handle again. I braced my sensationless feet against the side of the doorframe. I pulled with a tremendous amount of effort, unable to hear the panting sound of my own breath, unable to smell the stench of sweat and fear that radiated off my skin, unable to even feel my own heartbeat in my chest. And then, like the police officer's mouths had torn skin, the door peeled away from the wall. The journey up the stairs would have been painful had I been able to feel anything. I fell a few times, once from nerves and others from the stairs flattening itself below my feet. On the last fall, my face slammed against the metal ground, and I saw a red drip onto my shirt, though I couldn't tell if it was from my nose or from my head. And then... There it was, the letters gone but still recognizable, the door at the top of the stairs. I burst through it and spilled into the hallway. The ones that housed the bank offices, only this time they seemed different. 
The hall paintings on the wall were blank, just thin rectangles upon plain wallpaper. The scenes I had passed on the way in, of the view of each office through the open door frames, was now just that. Scenes. They were flattened into pictures against the wall, the rooms completely inaccessible. I ran still further, turning around another corner, and then I could see it. Employees only. There, a door that still had its sign. My salvation. I read the words as I stumbled towards the door, and then I blinked. My left eye came open, but my right did not. It was... It was stuck as though with glue. The top lid to the bottom. And I knew from what I had seen the police officers in the vault room that this was absolutely something to be afraid of. So I ran. I, I spilled out into the cold marble bank floor. That was the first thing I noticed. The, f the floor was cold. I could feel cold again. I could taste the blood in my mouth, the ache in my legs. I could feel the immense pain of having to rip my eyelids back apart where they had fused. And of course, I could see it. Flattened against the wall, the door that read employees only. The handle of which was now merely a picture. Forever out of reach. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It really helps me out whenever you guys do things like listen, or watch. And it really helps if you guys also subscribe to the podcast, or subscribe to the YouTube channel, or do things like clicking the bell, or clicking the like button. For those of you who are looking to actually talk to me live, and not just listen to me on the podcast, or the live stream, or what have you, then you can actually head over to twitch.tv slash MrCreepyPasta, where I record a lot of these episodes that you see live. Also, it's just fun for me to be able to interact with you guys, and sometimes we do other fun games. And as always, I want to give a very special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the ones who help me keep the lights on the house, as well as allow me to do things like commission brand new stories. In case you guys haven't noticed, we hit that tier. So... A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stricken, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krause, G Weevil 3, Tristan Pelton, 1 800 Nightmare, Acid System, Aaron Stormcrow, Azarine Fox, Bobby Carmen, Chris Lovin, Cryptic Nightmares, The Doctor, Daniel Paulson, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Euro Gore, Freddy Krueger, Fried Chicken 12, Hades Nephew, Infertile One, James Bruce, James Lowe, Jason VR Wilson, Jimbo the Hutt, Jordan Nels, Jordan Johnson, Caleb Dougal, Kiri the Sloth, Legit Quad Feed, Liam Newman, Lisa Cottrell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Michael Scarborough, Nico Kyle, Nina Smith, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Rafael Rodriguez, Robert White, S Man, Sky Harbor, Snails Burnett, Talon Carlick, The Ginger Bros, Trace Miles, Suji Campbell, Tinany, Unknown Nobody, Andre Garcia, Brianna Wright, Brian Ace, Caspian, Hogunchi, and Someone You Love. And also a very special thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. Oh, all you guys who are listed as patrons and everybody who's even supporting for just one dollar i really love and appreciate you guys and if you want to join them you can always head over to patreon.com slash mr creepypasta even a dollar a month honestly it keeps the show going so thank you guys so much and to everyone out there sweet dreams